Um, so welcome everybody to CPAST. Um, this is a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation um, and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST. My name is Genevieve Johnson. I'm the Aquatic Ecosystem Restoration Coordinator for the Bureau of Reclamation and the Federal Co-Director of CCAST, along with Matt Graybaugh from the Fish and Wildlife Service. CCAST is intended to support landscape scale conservation and restoration by enhancing issue-based peer-to-peer knowledge exchange through the development of case studies, workshops, and webinars like today's. And we use case studies as a foundation for communities of practice that address drought and climate adaptation, grassland restoration, and introduced aquatic species. If you'd like any more information on either CCAST or the communities of practice, please email me or Anna directly, and Anna's going to insert our addresses into the chat box. Um, probably everybody's familiar with all of the Zoom um, and other platforms now since we've all been working from home for so long. But if you aren't, um, to make the group chat appear, just hover over the Zoom screen until, uh, until the toolbar appears and click the little bubble icon. Um, we do, we are recording this webinar and so everybody's microphones have been muted. We do ask that you keep the video off during the session, um, during the presentation part, especially to help with bandwidth. Um, once we have time for Q&A at the end, um, you can turn on your video to ask those questions. Um, during the webinar, during the presentation itself, if you have any questions um, for the presenters, please insert them into the group chat and we'll facilitate that Q&A. And of course, if you have any technical questions or anything like that um, related to Zoom or anything else, you can put those in the chat and Anna and I will monitor those as well. So now I'm going to turn it over to Anna. Thanks, Genevieve, and welcome everybody. My name is Anna Weinberg, and I work with the CCAST team at the University of Arizona at based in Tucson. Um, I joined CCAST uh, over a year and a half ago as the coordinator of the Drought and Climate Adaptation Community of Practice. Today, I am super excited uh, to welcome a presentation from Samuel Sandoval and Stephanie Palladino about their team's research on the challenges of and opportunities for implementing environmental flows in the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo basin. Sam is a professor and extension specialist in water resources at the University of California, Davis, uh, University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources, and a collaborator with the California Water Resources Institute. He is a water resources scientist interested in improving water management for human and environmental needs in California and throughout the border region, um, and is considering the economic, environmental, and social justice aspects for long-term sustainable strategies. He is the co-host of the Water Talk podcast, the founding member of the Water Management Lab, and a current co-lead of the Permanent Forum of Binational Waters, a network of scientists interested in the shared waters between both nations. Stephanie Palladino is an independent environmental anthropologist who has collaborated out of the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center and the University of Oklahoma Center for Applied Social Research on a project on water management in the Rio Grande. She has conducted work with agriculturalists, fishers, forest dependent folks um, on environmental governance, justice, equity, and sustainability projects. She calls herself Merrillek Research, which means mighty fine research in Sitsal Maya. Um, I also want to call out that there are many people that were part of the team in this research, including Jack Friedman and Jennifer Coach, who were uh, PIs on this project. Um, a final reminder before I turn it over to Sam and Stephanie, if you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box and I will relay them to our speakers afterwards. With that, Sam and Stephanie, we are ready for you. Stephanie, uh, well, let's let's start. Um, uh, I will also like to mention, so Stephanie is one of the co-authors on this one. Uh, I say I'm seeing we have also Sean, and that is another co-author, uh, Ramon. Uh, size, who else do we have in here? I'm looking at some other co-authors that are here. So anyway, if uh, at some point any, any of the other co-authors want to make a uh, uh, comment. Uh, Stefan and I, we will be kind of talking uh, the manuscript or the paper that we just published. I put it the reference and the link on the chat. Um, 
So uh, I think this one, I, I wanted to be a little bit more of a conversation and what you're gonna be or uh, see or what you're gonna be seeing from us is uh, Stephanie and I having some of these discussions. So uh, Stephanie, uh, Sean, uh, Ramon, at any point, feel free to um, uh, to talk. This is uh, a paper that uh, came, uh, uh, most of the people here were funded through the South Central Climate Adaptation and Science Center from USGS. And this was just one of those uh, uh, passions that as we were having a, a group of all these people, then we decided to, um, uh, to write together. I have to say that um, it was very collaborative that uh, uh, Stephanie and I and others might be presenting here, but this is a joint effort. It was a, a true joint effort. Uh, we wouldn't have put anything like this if, if we haven't uh, worked together. Um, it was also fun. Um, so uh, what you're gonna be seeing here is the different stages of the, so these are the main sections of the paper and we will be discussing a lot of them. So you're gonna see how we are advancing through these different sections. Um, so let's actually, let's start diving in. So um, basically these are uh, the main sections. We know that the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, uh, so Rio Grande as it is known in the United States, Rio Bravo as it is known in Mexico, I mean, it. It is about 3,000 kilometers and the length from here all the way to here. And two thirds are the border. So 2,000 kilometers somewhere here. Um, it is the home of 10.4 million people. Uh, the fifth longest uh, river in North America. Uh, something that we discussed here on this uh, paper was the that this is a system that is coupled, a coupled natural and human system. So we could not, you cannot uh, unentangle the social from the ecological system uh, throughout this area. So that's why we start kind of looking at the uh, Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, the RGB as a socio-ecological system. Um, the river has been degraded and we'll be, we'll be talking about it. I think one of the places that we always refer is this part, the Forgotten Ridge where pretty much right now there is no water in there. Um, and throughout the, I would say the, the um, I mean, depending on how we say the more recent or the, uh, the more recent history or the last 200, 250 years, um, pretty much environmental flows have not been considered. And I'm saying 200 years, pretty much after the 1870s, when we have a significant change on the, on the basin, there has not been, a, environmental flows have not been a, a considered. Um, 1880, in 1880, in this area, in El Paso, Ciudad Juarez, there was no water. So since 1880, at least it's been recorded that the influences of the humans have uh, affected the system heavily. So um, I think with all the people that we were discussing there, our objective was to um, kind of put all our ideas, concepts together, synthesize the literature review, the knowledge on environmental flows, and discuss what are the challenges, opportunities, and uh, these success stories or initiatives that we've seen that they were, that they were implemented. Um, let me see. Uh, okay, so we have some of these research questions and actually Stephanie helped me out quite a lot with these ones. So one is, what is the current knowledge on environmental flows and the relation to ecosystems and human water needs? And the second one is, how does the current governance appear to either support or do not support the establishment of environmental flows? And if there are policies that have been implemented uh, related with environmental flows and what lessons can be learned. Actually, before moving forward, Stephanie, anything that I have missed? Uh, Sean, uh, Ramon. Uh, 
I, I think some well that's great. And I, I think the only thing I would add is that um, the team that worked on this paper, this large group of authors were very multidisciplinary. So it's something we all talk about. We all say we need to do, and then we kind of blunder through it um, one way or another because we don't learn how to do it in in school, particularly in university or whatever mm -hmm. in our programs. Um, and I think we really had a really wonderful experience in that regard with this, um, that people brought different pieces to it together, but then we also would have these kind of aha moments when, you know, the different pieces get put together and now I understand it a little bit differently. So it kind of, yeah. uh, so I'm just putting that little pitch in there. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Stephanie. And um, yeah, I agree. And, and many of the times it was, a, we rework this, uh, a paper at least two or three times. You did a huge restructure of it because it was, um, I, I don't think anyone can see where the hand of one author started and when the other hand started because it was very intertwined the work well. So I'll start, <laughs> I'll start in this part and then later Stephanie will take a little bit more of the driving seat. Um, I think one of the main characteristics of the um, Rio Grande is a very diverse uh, topography. Um, so it has a huge gradient from the Rocky Mountains all the way to the ocean. Um, climatologically is the same from snow dominated to a uh, hurricane dominated. Um, pretty much there are, a, in terms of water sources, well, and it crosses uh, five ecoregions. In terms of water sources, we have the upper portion, so the San Juan Mountains, the Rocky Mountains in here. Then we have other important sources, which is the monsoon and all the hurricanes and tropical storms on this area. And the third one is the groundwater. So groundwater is, is another important source in this area. So I think it's, it's good to remember those. Uh, the natural flow regime, as you're seeing here in the upper portion, it, it was mostly a snow dominated, a snow melt uh, signature. Then in some of these tributaries, it has more like uh, rainfall, monsoon season driven um, uh, regime. And then as the river was going, the main stem was uh, going down, we have this bimodal snow melt and a monsoon driven. So basically this is, this is where we are. A lot of these uh, species, just to mention the Rio Grande cottonwood, the Rio Grande cutthroat, um, cutthroat trout, um, they were adapted and the silver amino, they were adapted to these uh, flow regimes. And all the native species, the uh, riparian vegetation and so on, they were, they were uh, adjusted to these ones. Now, this section, uh, we call it water competition and climate change, but this was the Anthropocene. And this is pretty much what you're seeing here. So I always tell that uh, the basin got chicken pox, uh, Le dio viruela, which is basically that, yeah, we have a lot of reservoirs in there. You can see how since the 1900s, we start having a lot of increase in the a reservoir storage. So the different reservoirs, how, where they, when they were built. Um, the natural outflow here, it should be on the order of 10 to 11 million cubic meters or 10 to 11 uh, cubic kilometers. And the storage is 2.5 that amount. So it is possible to store 2.5 times the amount of the average stream flow here. Um, then, um, oh, in terms of climate change, sorry, I didn't want to just kind of, uh, so we know that droughts uh, are expected to become more severe. Uh, we also have seen an increase in the frequency of hurricanes from both the Pacific and the coast. Um, we know that there will be some decreasing flows, mostly in base flow and snowmelt rates. And in some places, such as the Rio Conchas Basin, 
is expected to decrease or a decline in the stream flow from the conscious, the natural stream flow of the conscious, 18%. 18% of water uh, uh, will be decreasing in this area due to climate change. Um, the next portion of environmental flows. So basically, we uh, um, uh, divided environmental flows and instrument flows. Environmental flows are flows that consider the ecosystem and human objectives. And instrument flows are uh, flows that only consider um, uh, water for the environment. So in terms of studies that they have done uh, in stream flows, so this is a list of all the different studies with the reference, the results, their flow method, and where they did these studies, that you can see them in these uh, points. So these are all locations where a in stream flow study or a, a study to determine water needed for the environment has already been done. So this, is, this is a nice map to show you where we have already information for um, in stream flows. The next part is that there have also been environmental flow studies that consider not only this, this information, these in stream flow studies or this water for the environment, but that they also consider how the system is currently allocated or some change in policies. So in-stream flows can be implemented in the, in the water management of the, of the Rio Grande. You can see here all the different references, what were the results, what is their ma water management strategy from reservoir operations to integrating simulation optimization models, agroeconomic models, who did it? I think at this point, the main take home message, well, there are actually two take home messages. So the first one is that we already have a lot of places where environmental flows have been defined. And the second one is that even though we know that the water management is very tight, the availability of water is very tight, there are people that they have already um, um, identified opportunities to provide environmental flows or in-stream flows in different parts of the, of the basin. So I, I do want to, to mention that. Um, now I think at this point, I will turn it over to water governance. And uh, Stephanie, do you, I, I can keep working. Do you wanna take over? Should I keep it going? Uh, como quiera, I can, I can jump yeah, in a bit. Okay. Please. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so that in a sense, um, you know, as Samuel says, suggests that hydrologically, there is some basis for um, many examples of some basis for being able to incorporate environmental flows in ways that don't jeopardize existing human uses of water, right? So as part of our, uh, one of our questions was, well, so what socio-political space is there in the basin for, you know, incorporating environmental flows as part of policy, as part of water management practice, um, especially given the scenarios that Samuel pointed out going forward about water, increasing water um, deficiency or scarcity. Um, so we turned our eyes to the team kind of took all its expertise and its work and, and looked at um, some of the other factors that influence that kind of space, ability to make that space for environmental flows. And one of those was water governance in the sense of formal water governance, um, which includes government, but also other kinds of institutions and organizations that influence and, and direct how water is used and managed. Um, and also some kind of non-governance, uh, some kind of key characteristics in the basin that are not specifically governance, but that shape that. Uh, that shape how, how people see and interact with water in the basins. And um, so one of those, let's see, um, you know, we do, so as you can imagine in this giant basin um, with its varied histories and different states and different countries, um, you know, to, to do a review of water governance um, 
we're talking about a lot of complexity and a lot of details. So, but we took a run at it and we um, did a review of some primary, I think you would say, agree some well, like some key concepts and key issues. Um, so if you're a governance specialist, you know, I'm sure you could come up with, help us come up with even more stuff. But, um, on, you know, so some of those key factors and we can, you know, people can ask questions or we can go into more detail about some things were not surprisingly, as is true of what of environmental governments governance in general in the contemporary world where we are now is that, um, you know, ecosystems are not managed as ecosystems, water basins are not usually managed as water basins, um, that, that the governance of those are divided up um, in the, uh, amongst many institutions and laws and um, other kinds of organizational arrangements, um, social arrangements. And so in the basin, um, even though we're talking about two countries with different, um, development and political histories, nevertheless, we found that um, it's common that um, the basin, you know, is uh, the governance of the basin is divided up. Uh, particularly in the US, it's more decentralized. In Mexico, it's more centralized. But nevertheless, um, uh, the basin in many aspects is divided up or fragmented. So um, we have in the US a lot of a lot of polycentric, meaning many centers of governance that influence water management and governance, um, but also overlapping and nesting, uh, and sometimes with um, either contradictory or complementary mandates. Um, we put in there distributed and divided. Distributed is another way of looking at the concept of fragmented, and that's a, a discussion in itself. Um, but um, across both countries, you find that various aspects of water or, or, element or elements of ecosystems related to water or of land related to water are divided up amongst different institutions. So you have you know, forests, parks, agriculture, water quality, water supply, groundwater, surface water, all being shaped by different institutions, which may or may not be in conversation with each other. Um, and that's across both countries. Um, we also find, as many of you know, I know, I see that there's a lot of um, great experts already on the Rio Grande system on the, on the conversation here. Um, all of the, most of these institutions over time since those late 1800s um, have been, um, as far as surface water goes in particular, have been focused on um, dominated by agricultural water use. So water rights and a lot of these institutions governing surface water in particular are um, centered around providing enough water for agriculture. And that's important because it uh, then inherently pits places this notion of competition for water um, and put and has the potential to pit environmental water flows against the need for agricultural water flows. Um, and that's something we look at a little bit. Um, and then of course the fact that um, there are interstate compacts and binational treaties that have also incrementally developed over time. Um, and the map on the right is one that represents, um, you know, uh, four of those major agreements. And you can sort of see a progression in time. I can't, I don't have a pointer, but the convention of 1906 down here in the middle, sort of, you know, establishing some agreements for water sharing of the upper reach, the Northern part above Presidio and Ojinaga down in the middle there. Um, for how those waters will be shared. And then the Rio Grande Compact in the 1920s, further elaborating on that, including how the waters will be shared by the states above um, Mexico. And then um, the, the Water Treaty in 1944, which really deals with the Southern half, the Southern region, uh, Southern section of the river system. Um, and mainly dealing with how so much of this water coming in from basically Mexican tributaries will be shared by the two countries in the context of also water sharing elsewhere. Yes, I did forget the Pecos River Compact um, 
1949 that then is an interstate compact between um, New Mexico and Texas for how that water will be shared in that tributary. But, but basically you find these agreements that as everyone, as you can imagine, are very difficult with great difficulty negotiated and with many other non-river and non-water related stakes involved in you know at great pains to develop these agreements and so they are very weighty and difficult to change um, with time and yet they've all been developed based on water conditions that um, as Samuel has suggested we can no longer expect to have in progress. And uh, Stephanie, the, the one uh, comment that I want to mention is that something that you will find on the manuscript interesting is that we uh, talk quite a lot about uh, uh, agricultural water use and agriculture. So for an environmental flows paper, we, we touch a lot of this. And this is basically because, um, yeah, it dominates the water rights. And a lot of these uh, agreements they were established based on the need for water for agriculture. Mm -hmm. And in that one is uh, all of us kind of seeing how can we, or ways that it can be partnered rather than just uh, putting some, some, some place there, the agriculture, we, we decided to also touch base on it. And so you have a structure, you have series of structures being built on top of each other based on certain premises about water availability and about what that water is going to be used for. And that's part of what we are reckoning with in looking at this issue. Um, Sorry, okay. Stefan, I think this one I, I uh, switched. Mm -hmm. But this, this will be the, so uh, we also on the paper kind of uh, try to uh, provide the fine line between giving all the details but also being a, a broad overview of what is what is going on here. Um, I mean, in general, we, we talked about the water governance, so the water rights and the uh, environmental flows uh, framework or legal framework for it. And pretty much in this one, well, in the United States is, uh, is the, the Western US water governance in terms of uh, first in time, first in right, uh, with the exception of uh, the low portion in here, which it has more a type of use uh, a division of water. But in the remaining states of the United States, it is first in time, first in right. Uh, in Mexico, it is more a priority based on the type of use. So depending on the type of use, if it is domestic, first, uh, municipal, second, uh, agriculture, third, and so on. So that is mostly the, the priority order in there. Um, in terms of the environmental flow, so we also describe the different um, frameworks, such as the Instream Flow Act in, in Colorado and how that one works uh, since 1973. Um, through the Colorado Water Conservation Boards and and also how I mean how environmental flows have been dealt between Colorado and then uh, uh, New Mexico and that will be after the opinion 1901 uh, that granted the authority to to provide water for the environment in here and then in Texas later the Senate Bill two so we went to kind of explaining those big broad strokes or what are the legal instruments within each state to provide environmental flows. And in Mexico, basically that water is property by the federal government. And then also they are the ones uh, in charge of providing environmental flows there. A similar, we also explain a similar law like the uh, um, Endangered Species Act, uh, there is a, a similar law, uh, I, I'm going to see it here, uh, Ley Federal para la Protección de la Vida Silvestre, something like that, mm -hmm. that it is, it is the, the similar on, on, on Mexico. Uh, also, there is a Mexican environmental flows norm. So we provide a lot of that. I think 
So this is uh, also part of the multidisciplinarity. We have, a, I think we had one lawyer on our team uh, and two or three very good uh, political science uh, scientists that we were able to put this one together. I think, uh, I yes. So just to summarize in a sense, you know, from that large view of those kind of larger structural developments that I was talking about, what Samuel is pointing out that the paper then goes and looks at each of those states in the US and then in Mexico and looks at, okay, so what legal space is there or has developed after those structures, you know, have been developed to create a space for environmental flows. And so there's a, a couple of, you know, paragraphs on each of those in a few paragraphs in the paper that kind of point to existing legal base, including in some cases, you know, uh, where uh, institutions are empowered to um, kind of hold in trust the, 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 right, the, in, the stream's own rights to water in a sense in Colorado, you know, there's a space for that to some new, real, more recent law uh, legal base in New Mexico and in Mexico, a very landmark case of, which I think probably some I will talk about later for creating a, a legal right for environmental water. Yep. So we kind of took it down one more level at that point. And then we, after kind of discussing this and the, and the legal framework from water and the environment, then we went to discuss challenges and opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I think in this one, I mean, something, this is, we have many, many aha moments, right? But so the paradox in the perception of uh, managing water or the challenge of managing the commons, I think something that it is um, interesting in this one is that in, in many places, people are, or authorities, users, they think of, of the river system as a portion of it. And, and that's, that's kind of a, some of their mind, even though they realize that they are part of a bigger picture. And one of the things that, that it really, or this type of paradox is that these uh, large agreements also is what is stitching together or making sure that there is a water transfer uh, is, is what is actually providing the identity that it is a whole basin, even though it is dividing it within each, each of these different regions. So it is, uh, this was one of the ha moments, like this is kind of the dual uh, tool that is kind of dividing it, but at the same time, making it together, right, Estefani? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think people um, in day, in uh, when you're on the ground and, and in those regions, people feel very much um, caught up by those agreements, those larger agreements and, um, and the constraints it offers and the, in some cases opportunities. Um, but it's, but it, and so it ends up creating this defense of our interests or our section of the river's interest or our sector's interests in those agreements. But at the same time, I feel like it's really, uh, it's one of the few, these agreements are among the few things that actually knit the whole thing together as a piece, even though it's been progressively divided and divided by um, engineering works, you know, reservoirs, canals, systems, and uh, policies um, over the centuries. So it's a, it's a, as Samuel calls it, paradox. Yeah. Um, and, and something that, I mean, some people even kind of at the same time realizing that they are managing some portions of the basin, but that the water source might be very distant or may come very from very far away. So it is, it is a paradox of kind of managing for the local, but then realizing that there are mechanisms that are putting things together, kneading the, the basin. So it can be function as a one. Mm -hmm. Then, uh -huh. go ahead. Oh, I'm just gonna, so, and so uh, I think that's one of the things we, one of the things that's talked about in the paper is how that kind of, that division into these sub basins and subsections of the river really um, kind of cognitively shape how people interact with the basin. And we see on the one hand, um, um, those defending of local interests, but we also see that uh, the ways um, in the way it, even if people are beginning to think about or trying to act upon things like environmental flows or broader issues, it still tends to be a lot of 
at the sub basin or sub region level that they're dealing with, in part just because it's this enormous basin um, with all this heterogeneity. I can't even pronounce it, but um, but also how you know these structures kind of reinforce that local um, consciousness at the same time that they force you to deal with the larger picture. Anyway. Yeah, and, and that one, that kind of a recent movement that people trying to look at the basin as a whole basin, and, and it, it has been that kind of counter movement. Um, mm -hmm. Then later we start talking about the central role of uh, agriculture uh, once again, and we discuss uh, river fed versus 20th century uh, agriculture and how farmers that are located along the river that depend on the variations of the, or that can see and depend from the variations of the river flow, uh, see the river as a living thing and they are uh, farmers and environmentalists protecting the river and then the 20th century agriculture where agriculture is mediated by infrastructure. And that one can be dams, uh, canals. Um, uh, I think that that was also a, an interesting uh, discussion that not agriculture is, is the same in the basin. Mm -hmm. And that's true across both countries. So in both countries, in both part, you know, um, in the basin in both countries, you find there is small scale agriculture that's still based on either, you know, it could be tributary or it could be their main channel, you know, river fed agriculture um, uh, that have maybe different things at stake and different ways of governing things um, and different decision making processes um, and different social implications as well as environmental implications then do that agriculture that then developed mostly beginning in the 20th century. I always have to do that count one year back and um, one century back uh, um, that are only possible through that re-engineering of the river system, right? And so there's a, a disconnect to a certain extent between that way of those ways of farming and the older, smaller scale river fed ones and maybe different risks that are being taken or that are implied or that have to be looked at if you're talking about introducing environmental flows. Um, so those are, you know, those are things we can talk about more later if people want to. And then the one thing that also we mentioned that the river as well, it shares their waters, but it is also the political boundary and how some of the things that we are talking are caught in the middle of national security. And then people living along the border, their human right to a good environment, to a clean environment and how there have been organizations that are working towards towards those, towards uh, providing good environment in Laredo and so on. Um, yeah, sometimes the river and everyone of us studying that one, we're caught in the middle on different things, non-water related. So a lot of decisions being made about the river based on nothing that really has to do with a riverine ecosystem or water use or water sharing, but more about other issues that are important to each country at different times, which changes. So um, you find that really impinging on, on management of the water and the river system itself. And then we went to, oh, so this will be uh, some of those uh, different locations of the irrigation districts, national parks, and, and places for protected areas. Um, then uh, we didn't have enough fun. We <laughs> uh, uh, provide uh, different examples of initiatives where environmental flows are happening. So one of those is um, this, the Rio Bravo Council, which uh, I'm happy to see here, uh, Oscar. So this Basin Council basically is, the, is a group of uh, stakeholders that, well, it's a legal body uh, that try to come up with planning and management of the basin on, on the Mexican side. And they have been considered uh, environmental flows as an integral part of their water distribution system. Um, 
it hasn't come well, the the way that I describe this is think that the five states on the Mexican side, they are trying to come up with a compact, with a way of kind of how water will be shared between Durango, well, users in Durango, Chihuahua, Coahuila, Nuevo León, and Tamaulipas. And as they are kind of figuring out all those different, if the reservoir is here, I'm gonna release that and so on. Part of those agreements, they are including environmental flows as uh, releases or water transfers from all the different a, a reservoirs to, to, in this case, to meet the treaty obligations. So it is interesting that um, you may think in users, agricultural users, industrial users, in this basin council, they value the, uh, the concept of environmental flows and providing water for the environment. The, the compact has not, hasn't been signed and it's been more now, I think, 17 years on the make. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it really shows, or it has been eye-opening on, on how that one is uh, uh, been happening. One of those, uh, Oscar, Oscar, who is here, Oscar Leal, he's been part of that uh, process working, working towards that. So that will be in this area. Then we have leasing of agricultural water rights for environmental flows in New Mexico. Um, Samuel, is it, and hmm. is it not the case then that um, one of the seats, one of the represent, there, there was a, That is correct. That's that is correct. Point. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, yeah, super things, things, which, so there is a, a water right here in these Cuatro Cienegas, and because there is a water right for the environment, Coahuila has a seat for an environmental uh, voting member on the Basin Council. So this, this, is, this, is, this is impressive, like for the first time in a Basin Council in Mexico, there is there is one person representing the environment with a voting power mm -hmm. on a basin council, and that is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And Pro Natura, the Pro Natura guys here, poof, they did a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And so, if I could jump in for a second, I mean, so what in this section of the paper, what we did is we were saying, okay, if you have all these very, you know, these in, uh, this institutional structures and even cognitive structures that are like having people think. Um, in terms of subsections and subbasins, and um, and also, you know, are built around agricultural rights, and there's a lot of competition and concern about who gets water and who doesn't. So then, what are the spaces? What have we been seeing as far as spaces opening up where people are actually trying to enact environmental flows, either as part of policy, or as part of you know some actual active attempt to institute an environmental flow. And these are some, I think this is not even an exhaustive list of what's in there. And the list that's in the paper is not exhaustive. But what we did was we tried to take different examples from across the basin of different ways that people are going at it. And I just was, um, I was thinking of summarizing some of the characteristics of them some well, and then leaving some time for questions or something. Okay, because there's a lot of really interesting uh, uh, examples there. But if we, you know, what we found was that, okay, a lot of the examples we found are not trying to change those heavy structures of water rights and compacts and treaties. I mean, those are sort of very slow moving, difficult to change things, but what they're doing is carving out creative spaces within them. And some of them, um, you know, sort of recognize that potential conflict or, or sense of conflict between environmental flows and agricultural rights. And what they have done is worked out ways to either temporarily or permanently create options through where agricultural water rights can be diverted to environmental flows. Um, so we have some examples of, um, in, for instance, in New Mexico, we highlight some examples where based on recent laws in New Mexico, um, there are uh, nonprofit organizations that were able to lease rights, agricultural water rights for a defined time of year to use uh, to leave in the river as environmental flows. And in that, um, and then there are some other instances of people, entities, uh, tribes in many cases, 
who were not using all their water for that year um, voluntarily released water into the system to so that some sections of the river could have an environmental flow. Um, we've seen some instances where, um, as Samuel was talking about, there are spaces within governance mechanisms like the council in the Rio Bravo Council, where there's actually um, a space for environmental flow representation, um, a voice. Um, and we've seen municipal ordinances that have said, okay, at our level, we're gonna decree that we want a certain amount of water left in our river system. So we have Santa Fe, Albuquerque as some examples. Um, we see examples, um, more exam oh, we see some examples of people working creatively with water sort of concepts that you might call water banking or water transfer of rights, again, on either temporary or long-term basis um, to allow, again, to not have to go through the legal process of changing the nature of agricultural water rights, but allowing them to be used. So one example, the, Elephant Butte Environmental um, Irrigation District, sorry, my brain hasn't been here for a while, which developed some internal policies that allowed agricultural water, to, allowed um, to see that restoration projects on the, uh, in their section of the Rio Grande are, need irrigation water in order to succeed, right? You have to water those plants, that, that, the vegetation. And so that, that way they didn't have to change the name of you know, the nature of the right, but could at least temporarily or on some long-term basis allow it to happen. So there's a variety of other arrangements that we don't really have time to go into. Um, and one more that um, is involving, we see more and more instances of people coming together uh, cross-boundary, cross-jurisdictionally, cross-disciplinarily, uh, cross-sectors to kind of look at water issues in the river, um, sometimes uh, precipitated by flood, sometimes precipitated by drought, or it could be by biodiversity concerns, but more of that kind of transboundary, trans-jurisdiction work going on, often with a cultural component like linking environment and culture as um, things that go together and that are things that people want to abate, creating a base that people want to work for, from. But I'll leave it there. I just wanted to kind of summarize that and then. Yeah, ex and excellent summary. And, and I think uh, we have some time. I think it will be good if anyone has a comment or, or question on this. Um, I don't know, I think I, I will prefer some of the things, Stephanie. Great, great work. I mean, yeah. The ones that are in there, I'm not sure if um, uh, Sean, uh, Ramon, if you can turn on also your camera. Anyone who has a comment question? Just a reminder the that folks might need to unmute yourself. Yeah. And yeah. while we're waiting for some questions, um, Thank you um, to the presenters, but I was wondering um, if you have any thoughts um, or suggestions on how to be able to tie all of these multiple objectives for restoration um, and agricultural water, um, as well as municipal water together as in a way that and this is going to be, sorry, a very large question, but um, any suggestions for how to tie all of these things together so that we don't look like we're competing for resources um, as much as we have in the past, especially given the knowledge that we are facing drought, continued drought conditions and climate change. Should I? Yeah, if you Should want, I start you and, yeah. and you jump yeah. in or whatever? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we do kind of come towards the end of trying to, there's actually, I think, a lot more juice that we could have extracted from all this work we did, but we made a start in the conclusions. And I think like one example is understanding, you know, having a better understanding of the, you know, the risks that people feel 
they the risks that people perceive, you know, from different sectors, um, what they have at stake, um, creating those spaces where that is recognized and reckoned with is one way we talk about, we see, um, you know, a lot of instances of people trying to build partnerships to build understanding of other water users positions. And like I say, risks um, and building empathy um, and respect for those. And I mean, th that may sound kind of Pollyannish in a way, but it's, it's actually pretty critical to doing something that meets multiple objectives instead of shutting down some people's needs and objectives and you know, addressing others. Um, easier said than done. I don't know if uh, Samuel, you want to add anything, or if I'm not, if I'm misunderstanding the question. No, Jim. I, you know, something that we mentioned also there is this uh, string of pairs, which is basically how uh, some improvements in a given area can help out improvements in an area downstream that can help out improvements in another area downstream that did yeah, take part in anything so you can see how it worked. Okay. Yep. Yep, yep, yeah. I think that's that was one of the things that we were kind of discussing. And the, the one other thing is that we have different so there are different tools. And and I think what we were trying to say is that some of these tools in certain areas might be kind of a, legally permitted in some other ones, no, but it, it is good to take a look at different strategies. So we can start as, as the uh, river is needed or is uh, put together by different of these uh, agreements. How can we do the same with some of these tools to try to start putting all these different water throughout the, the river? And um, also actually, uh, Sean, I'm seeing you hear something that you want to mention before or that you want to um, add to what what we presented here on the on the paper or or on this question? The same, Ramon. Sean, anything to add? Sure. Yeah, I, I just say um, great job, Stephanie and and Sam, um, summarizing all of this. The only thing I would add is um, you know much like the the large collaborative effort that we put together to to put together this paper. Um, I think really the key was moving forward for, for, you know, like implementing environmental flows in the basin is, you know, collaboration across all of these um, different spatial scales and, and institutions and management um, that we have in the basin. So, um, yeah, that's, that's really the only thing I would add and um, great job to, to both of you. Yeah. If I could add one thing to that, I mean, am I on still? Yes. Um, uh, I mean, we, some of these examples we provided, you know, um, they're all in process or they're nascent, you know, they're just in their beginning stages. They haven't had years to play out. Um, so really we were saying, these are things to look at and learn from. Like, let's look at how these work out. Let's look at what uh, problems they fall into. And during the time that I've done field work in the basin, um, you know, people have huge amounts of water knowledge and river knowledge and all kinds of other knowledge in the different sections. Um, and what many people often told me was, I would love to, you know, um, I don't have time, you know, professionally, uh, financially, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have time to be part of forums that help me see the problems in a bigger perspective, like to, instead of just my little section of river and fighting for you know, those interests or my sector's interests. Um, uh, there's, there's not enough, um, even though there's such a strong water community and lots of, you know, water conferences and things. Um, I had people tell me in San Luis Valley that they, even though they're part of the Rio Grande system, they're used to going to conferences about water related to the other river systems in Colorado, but not really to the ones, you know, farther south in the river system. Um, and uh, so there is a role there, I think, for sharing this knowledge and sharing these examples of how people are approaching environmental flows and kind of looking and trying to build that as a knowledge base and a momentum and sharing that. Yeah. Thanks, Stephanie. And I, there's a little bit of conversation happening in the chat that I just want to uh, bring up and then I can 
wrap everything up and we can call it a day, but Brian had made the comment uh, earlier about given the highly depleted, depleted condition of the river throughout most of its length, how do you see the greatest opportunity for flow restoration? Um, there was a co couple comments from Sam on that, but I'm wondering if y'all have any other thoughts, maybe closing thoughts. So in that one, Stephanie was mentioning that all of the above, I mean, the reality is that we were, yeah, leasing voluntary releases, municipal ordinances, look for water rights, say, think out of the box and preserve one part of the basin so water can fall. So look into land use conservation so you can have good uh, uh, water supply, uh, Irrigation, seeing how different irrigation districts within their own um, uh, operations, how they can allow for transferring of irrigated water into the environment without losing their, their water rights. That is extremely important for, for ag users. They can put, or similarly, they are doing it with municipal use. If they are assured that if they leave water in the river, it will not be taken away from them. That, that may be a good uh, solution. Environmentally flow advisory groups, I am seeing Jeff Bennett and he was a key instrument on uh, doing the be best environmental flows estimation in, the, in that Senate bill too. Um, NGOs promoting water land and water conservation, again, Oscar there, uh, looking at all these different basins and uh, uh, buying sometimes the land and, and protecting that land so it can be uh, provided water in at least in this area. So yes, it's, it is all of the above. The reality is it's all of the above and, and collaboration. I don't know, Stephanie, Sean? Um, I think you elaborated a point that I was implying about risks and that is that thing that, you know, a lot of people in the agricultural sector are willing to consider a lot of things, but there's that long-term concern. And one of the reasons some of these smaller examples we talk about work is that there are examples of people who own agricultural land who are not using, don't need to, the water for agriculture that moment, but that it allows them to, there's an option to let the water be used for environmental flow and not lose their rights long-term. Um, so those kinds of ways of addressing that might even need to be, it might even be a question of scaling up a bit, like if that water, that bank of water rights that doesn't need to be used in a given moment could be a more fluid, if I may use the term, uh, pool um, that could then be distributed. You know, maybe there's a larger pool above the level of an irrigation district or above the level of um, you know, just one section of the river where people can say, I'm going to contribute these, you know, this year or for the next three years, but I don't want to lose these rights. I mean, some, that kind of flexibility, I think, is what's called for at the moment to be experimented with, if not making bigger changes in the bigger structures. No, we need you all, all you experts that are on this. I know there's a ton of you really incredibly knowledgeable, knowledgeable Rio Grande people in here. We need you to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> the work and, continues. And, and something that Sergio mentions that it is true that I mean, it is more than just individual efforts. The same what happened on this paper, what happened with the larger community, which is let's join forces. Let's see us as a common front where I mean, in the end, we want the same objective, which is have a, a healthy river. And I think that's, that's, that's the bottom line anyway. I... Great. Well, I feel like that's a good place to end. I'm gonna cut us off because I wanna respect everybody's time. Um, thank you so much, Sam and Stephanie and the rest of the project team. And again, all the other experts on the line um, for joining our chat today. It's uh, really cool to talk about all of this work happening and really exciting to see all of these pieces being pulled together. Um, we, as Genevieve mentioned in the chat, this webinar was recorded and will be made available on the CCAST YouTube channel where you can find all of our previous webinars. Um, if you enjoy learning from these case studies, I encourage you to visit the uh, or 
related projects, I encourage you to visit CCAST and the case study dashboard, where we currently have 118 case studies on a whole variety of topics, including several related to water management in the Rio Grande. Um, we're running, working on lining up webinar speakers for the coming months. So um, please contact us if you would like to receive any further webinar announcements, but are not yet on our mailing lists. Um, and finally, we thank you for your time and thanks again to Sam and Stephanie and all for joining us and giving us this excellent presentation. We hope you all have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday. <laughs>